So today, we continue on the, uh, the, some, the sermon series, the Summer on the Mount. And uh, if you are new, we've been wrestling with a couple questions. Who is Jesus and what did he teach? We've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. If you were here last week, we kind of went verse by verse and opened it up for discussion. If you're watching live stream, it was hard to catch part of that. Uh, the video didn't turn out the greatest, so we live and learn and how to do that next time if we're going to try to do more interaction. But thank you for those of you who were able and willing to share. I thought it was very meaningful to just kind of hear feedback and interaction from other people. So today, we continue on Matthew 6, at the very end of that text. So we read through Matthew 1 verses or Matthew 6, verses 1 through 24 last week. And today we're going to read Matthew 24 through Matthew 34, which begins, as I read before, therefore I tell you, do not worry. Okay, so anyone here struggle with stress, worry, anxiety? Raise your hand. Anybody ever struggle with stress, worry, anxiety? Yes. When I prepare for these sermons on Sunday mornings, I usually start reading through the text and then gathering a bunch of information and then doing some really obscure research. I think probably, Angie, you can relate, where it's just like sometimes it takes you off. You're like, health. What does it mean to be healthy? What does stress mean? How do we interact? Which led me down the trail when I was Googling happy things to some images. We're going to go through a few of those images just for fun today, and I have them on there. Um, Ow! Historians will probably call our era the eggs, the age of anxiety by Billy Graham. He wrote that a long time ago, early on in his ministry. And I thought that was interesting, the age of anxiety. And part of this, I think, is also we're in an age of transition in faith, in culture, and everything else, which also adds to our anxiety. Now the happy pictures. Aww. And we'll keep going through. These are just, aren't they cute? No. There's a sheep. Happy sheep. <laughs> There's a baby. <sighs> Somebody was having too much fun. Is there one more? Is that the last one? That's the last one. So who feels less stressful already? Who wants to like throw up in their mouth and be like, oh my gosh, I thought I had to look at that only on Facebook. What the heck? So uh, in my research, just learning about stress, I came across this book. I have not read it, so I cannot say if it's good or bad, but it's a book written, it's the title is The End of Stress, and analyzing more or less the neuroscience behind stress. And there's a website, theendofstressbook.com. You can go to, and I clicked on it, and you can take a stress Test, which is dangerous. So, warning. So I went on, I was like, hmm, I wonder, I do yoga, I meditate, I don't feel very stressful. I'll go on, I'll take this test and see. And this is, it scores you in numbers, by the way. And this is what it said after I took the test. Scores of 13 and under are considered average or low. Scores between 14 and 19 indicate moderate stress. Scores of 20 or over are considered high stress. Moderate and high stress need your attention. Your score, Aaron Stritzel, is a 26. (laughs) I was like, ooh, bring on the yoga, more meditation, something here. Then it took me on, what about the side effects? I mean, we've all probably heard of this before, but the side effects in our physical manifestations in our bodies, what are the side effects of stress, anxiety? And there's a slide here. Difficulty swallowing. Dizziness, dry mouth, fast heartbeat, fatigue, headaches, inability to concentrate, irritability, muscle aches, muscle tension, nausea, nervous energy, rapid breathing, shortness of breath. I feel like I need to start slowing down even while I'm saying this. Shortness of breath, sweating, trembling and twitching, suppression of immune system, digestive disorders, muscle tension, short-term memory loss, premature coronary artery disease, or a heart attack. Thank goodness. Wow. Wow. It can lead to depression and suicide if not kept in check or allowed to go too much. Some other stats, and these are for the U.S. in specific, which I found interesting. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S., affecting 40 million 
adults, or roughly 18% of the population in America. Anxiety disorders cost the U.S. more than $42 billion a year. It's like, billion? Oh my goodness. But here's an interesting thought, and if you follow along on Facebook, you might have seen how I posted this on One Church Facebook. We live in the greatest superpower the world has ever known. We lack less than anybody who's ever lived before us. We have more, more privilege, more money, more options, more freedom, and yet for some reason we struggle with stress and anxiety more than anybody else who's ever lived before. And I began to think, why is that? What is the connection here? In that book, The End of Stress, the author writes, if you add all the deaths caused by stress-related illness, such as heart disease, strokes, cancer, immunodeficiency, diabetes, premature aging, just to name a few, you have the number one cause of death in America today. So that can be a little controversial because there's obviously obesity and different things, but if you take in stress and how it affects our immune systems, our health, all of that, you have the number one cause of death in America today. Here's things that were interesting. On the next slide, things to keep in mind. 40% of the things we worry about never happen. 30% have already happened. You can't do anything about it. 12% of worries are needless worries about health. 10% are petty issues. Only 8% of the things we actually worry about are real worries. And only half of those, 4%, are actual things you can do something about. 96% of the things we worry about, we cannot do anything about. It's a total waste of time and energy, and it sucks our health and our life out of us. As the Wisdom Book of Proverbs says, Anxiety weighs down the human heart, but a good word cheers it up. Anxiety weighs us down. Worry, stress, anxiety. So why do we worry so much? What is at the root cause of that? I want to invite you to read along with me as we did. This is a different translation uh, in Matthew, the text for today. Therefore, I tell you, Jesus again is speaking. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Next slide. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Can, you add, can any of you add by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So here's a couple of things. First of all, there's two ways I could have taken this, two different paths. I'm going to take us down one path for a little bit, and I'm going to take us down another path that really spoke to me. And so in preparing and and teaching, uh, I tend to go with whatever speaks to me. So after you research and you gather, you're like, what is speaking to me? Uh, One of the critiques I think that I give among uh, some of the more modern Christianity is there's always only one way to interpret a scripture or a passage. And if you look at your life, if I look at my life, there's been times where I read a passage and I get something from it. And then there's other times later on I read something and it speaks to me in a different way. So maybe there's more than one way of understanding this, or at least there's more than one way that God's spirit can speak to you through that passage. So one avenue I'm going to take and just briefly show. A couple weeks ago, we talked about Uh, the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew. There's also a parallel sermon in Luke called the Sermon on the Plain. Well, in Luke's gospel, what Luke does is he tells the story of this greedy farmer, or, or has Jesus tell the story of the greedy farmer, where this farmer said, you know what, I am going to work as hard as I can, save up as much as I can, store away, retire early, and then eat, drink, and be merry. Doesn't seem so bad. But then God gets extremely angry with that farmer. Like, hmm. And then this text 
do not worry text follows that as a sort of commentary on that. And then if you read in Luke's narrative, he ends with what we read last week, which is this idea of do not store your treasures on earth where moth and dust and rust destroys, but store up your treasures in heaven. (laughs) Paraphrasing, of course. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So Luke has this, I think, almost a better flow that kind of comes together here. Interestingly enough, uh, that, that word, the Greek word, do not worry, can also be translated, do not strive for, or do not seek after. So in, in essence, Jesus here is saying, do not seek after riches and material possessions. These things will be added to you. Seek after the kingdom of God. Seek after things that are eternal. Of course, that begs the question, what does that mean? And I think that's what we have to wrestle with. What is eternal and what is passing? And where is our focus? Where is our attention given to? In America, in a highly, which we talked about last week, in a highly consumeristic, capitalistic society, it is so counterintuitive to say, don't focus on wealth and riches and accumulating lots of stuff, but focus on things that matter. Uh, I watched a tearjerker of a movie last night called um, The Family Guy with... uh, Gerard Butler, Uh, it just came out, and I was sitting there crying, because it's one of those where he works way too much, and then something happens to his kids, and he realizes, oh my gosh, I've taken it for granted, and rearranges his life, and unfortunately, sometimes it's what it takes for some people to say, oh, I was giving myself to riches, the things that pass, the things that really don't matter, instead of giving my things that are of eternal value, my relationships, the people around me, and others. The greedy farmer thought only of himself and no one else around him, which is a challenge for all of us living in America. Who are we thinking about? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What do you worry or seek after? It's a challenge for us. That was one way you could take it. Now I'm going to come back and take it a different way. Let's go, can we go back to that last slide, the one right before this? And I want to ask us a question. And this is something, um, the next one in between these two. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Susie. Uh, I never saw this before, or it never stood out to me before. But what does Jesus point to when he's saying, do not worry? What does he begin to point to? And I underlined it there to help it kind of pop out the lilies, the birds, the grass of the field. Jesus says, don't worry, and then points not to scripture, although he does in other places, but then he points to creation. Interesting. Look at creation. Thomas Aquinas, and I do have a slide for this. I apologize, Susie. Thank you for jumping around with me. Thomas Aquinas once said, creation is the primary and most perfect revelation of the divine. Creation reflects the creator. Which made me wonder, could it be that worry at its core is the result of a disconnection from the source of all, from the creator? And a large part of maybe our worry and stress today is a disconnect from creation itself. The result of this disconnection is a false sense of control. Perhaps control is at the root of worry and stress. Because think of it this way, we control most of our life. Thankfully, we control the environment in here, so you don't come to worship and it's like 110 degrees. But we can control, we can make it comfortable. You can go in your car, drive away today, go out to eat if you have the money to be able to do that. In your car, that's probably air conditioned. And if not, I so help you God. Um, (laughs) But you can control that. You can go buy strawberries at any time of the day, in season and out of season. You can control that. We have so much control over all areas and aspects of our life. Perhaps part of it is we haven't exercised those muscles of surrender and trust because we've been able to control so much. Back to creation Paul writes to the Romans, for what can be known about God is perfectly plain, for God has made it plain. 
Ever since God created the world, God's everlasting power and deity is there for the mind to see in all things that God has created. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus points to creation, saying, look at creation. Learn from creation. Paul here saying, what can be known about God has been made plain in all things that God has created. Uh, as if you've been a part of one church, you know one of my favorite authors and spiritual leaders is Richard Rohr, um, who I often quote a lot. Richard Rohr is a Franciscan friar. He began uh, a center for action and contemplation at Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he, he has many books that are fantastic. Uh, he also does a, a daily, uh, um, a, a daily, what would you call it? Meditation, thank you. I'm like looking to my wife, help me, please. <laughs> The Daily Meditation. You can sign up uh, online, get an email, or through Facebook. And I wanted to read, um, it's a little bit longer than a short piece, uh, of a meditation that he wrote a couple years ago that stood out to me, and so I just Googled it. I was like, I know he wrote something about this that really, I think, challenges and speaks to this aspect. Um, let's go, can we go back to the last slide? I'm gonna come back to this one here in just a moment. And I'll read part of it, and then we'll go to the next slide, which is the very end quote. So, Richard Rohr writes, both Anthony of the Desert and Thomas Aquinas said there are two books of Scripture. The book of Scripture is the natural world, which is the first book, and has existed since the Big Bang 14 billion years ago. He's estimating a little bit up, right? 14 billion years ago. The second book of Scripture is the written Bible, which has only existed for about 2,000 years. Just to be clear, in in case that is challenging, um, I know from reading Richard Rohr that he values scripture, that God speaks through the written word of God. He's not trying to devalue it in any way, that scripture speaks to us, but what he's saying is there's also other sources that speak to us as well. So he goes on and writes, we gave most of our attention to the written book, which has kept us in our limited left brain outside of direct experience and with a dualistic mind that the ego always prefers. Mere words, even most especially holy words and authoritative words, when used apart from any experience of an eternal word, tend to create argumentative people. And we see this, I think, play out in so many ways. What did not honor, or we did not honor and learn from the first and the primary Bible of creation, So how would we know how to honor and properly use the second Bible? We largely mangled and manipulated the written word of God for our own ego purposes. Instead of receiving it inside of the mystery, the awe, the silence, and the surrender which the natural world demands of us and teaches us. Many have said that a fundamental attitude of awe is the primal religious experience and the beginning of the search for God If we start with mere argument, we never leave that battlefield. Imagine a religion called ah-ism. Instead of wasting time trying to disprove miracles, this religion would be inhabited by people who see that everything is a miracle. Only people who can fully surrender to things beyond themselves can experience awe, wonder, or enchantment. Spiritual surrender is not giving up, which is the way we usually understand the term. And then you can read along with me in the next slide. Surrender, he writes, is entering the present moment and what is right in front of you fully without resistance or attempts to control it. In that sense, surrender is almost the exact opposite of giving up. In fact, it is, the be- it is being given to surrender. I think worry is often the results of not being able to surrender to the present moment, to be present here and now, to not be in control. See, worry is often the result of either us thinking about the past or the future, right? The past, I shoulda, woulda, coulda, I wish I would have, and dwelling on the past. Now, I will say this, there is a difference between going through an experience and just trying to gloss over it and not working through it versus worrying about it. Sometimes I think we go through things in our life 
that we should go back and say, what did this do to me as a human being? How did this crisis, this thing that happened, affect me? I'm not just gonna gloss over it. I'm going to go and dig. But that is different than worrying about it, wishing it would have changed, wishing we would have done something different. And the future, which is one of my biggest difficulties. I was just talking to Jack this last week about being a futuristic person uh, and, and how hard that is sometimes. Because my mind goes to the future. What if, what if this happened? What if that happened? What if we did this? What if we did that? I was recently talking to a spiritual director and uh, uh, somehow got in the vein of the future and, and what if that and I don't know if this and, and she just calmly said, Aaron, you can't live in the future. All you have is the present. So you're trying to live out there, which doesn't even exist now. You're worrying about all this other stuff that doesn't even exist. And oftentimes, my wife will probably attest to this, that I feel like a hot, uh, hot helium balloon, you know, just pulled, barely hanging on. I just want to float away up somewhere else in the future that doesn't even exist and all my worries and stress. And Jesus, by the way, talks about this at the very end of the chapter in Matthew 6. I'd like to invite you to read along with me in the message translation, which we read last week. Jesus says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the times come. That is so hard, though. So hard. I think because we are in control of so much of our life and we haven't exercised those muscles. One of the verses that has been speaking to me more and more these days is found in Philippians. Uh, I'd like to invite you to read along with me. Paul's writing and says, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, this is a challenging verse for me, in part because how I was raised and trained and taught what Jesus did on the cross and all of that. Um, and now I see it through different lenses and come through. But the thing I want to focus on here is in verse 7. He emptied himself. And that word in the Greek is kenosis, which means to empty self, to release yourself, or to surrender. Now I see the life of Jesus much more as a continuing surrender to the Spirit of God in his life, in that present moment. I think at the core of all spirituality and religion is this idea of surrender. Now, Buddhism, and I speak of Buddhism because that's the one I probably know the most of, even though I don't know a lot of Buddhism, but Buddhists will teach that suffering is the result of attachment and everything is impermanent. Everything is impermanent. So if you attach yourself to it, you will eventually suffer loss, grief, anxiety. So their teaching is don't be so attached to that thing. In Christianity, we call it surrender, kenosis, trust. I think that's what the word faith really means. Faith isn't about having the right beliefs. It's about trust. And that's why in this text, Jesus says, O oh, ye of little faith. I don't think Jesus is saying, looking down on them, oh my gosh, you petty, stupid people. You missed it. I think what Jesus is saying is, you're missing it. If you worry, you lack the trust in what God is doing in your life, to trust that God is working in it and through it. Does that resonate? Does that make sense, hopefully, a little bit with some of us here today? Jesus, who emptied himself, Coming back to creation, um, my wife, Molly, recently went to the Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina for a week and got out of Phoenix. Gosh, I was so jealous. So she got to go visit this uh, farm, this Gaia Farms for class. And Gaia is an herbal company. They sell it like sprouts and all kinds of different things. She got to walk around the mountains and she sent me pictures of waterfalls and stuff while I was sitting in here in the heat in Phoenix. Um, but one of the things she noticed is that people there that work, and, and especially the owner, had this deep spiritual connection 
there may or may not have been religious, may or may not have been Christian, people she interacted with, but they had this deep spiritual connection there, uh, an intuitive spirituality, if you will, a connection to the earth, a connection to creation. Um, sometimes I wonder, because we're so disconnected, especially as Western Christians from creation, how perhaps we've lost or forgotten or not being able to see so much of how God works in the world. And if we're really honest, how we exploit things without knowing it, maybe unintentionally, but we exploit the very earth that sustains us. In order for us, by the way, to create a, a sustainable future for our kids, for our grandkids, something will drastically need to change. We cannot continue to consume and consume and just pretend like there's unlimited resources. I think we have the ability and the means to create a sustainable world, but it means going back to creation. I once had a Native American friend and just interacting with him and the dialogue and how deeply spiritual he was and respectful of creation in a way that I was like, I just did not, I felt disconnected from in my religious background, in my religious training. I think Richard Rohr hit it right where we've neglected the first scripture almost completely and focused on the second scripture alone. In fact, if you even look throughout history, missionary training, missionary endeavors, colonialism, what did we do? We went to another country, said all of this that you're doing and all your beliefs and practices is wrong and we present a new way of doing it. And the more Christian they looked or became, the more Western they became and cut them off. In fact, I was talking to somebody recently who mentioned, um, I don't remember who this was, um, who mentioned talking, uh, uh, having a group of Catholic priests come in and doing this extensive workshop and having, having a Native American woman just begin to cry and say, I, was, I always knew this was true, but I was told that this wasn't okay from the missionaries that came through. We were told that having reverence for creation, having respect and connection for creation and nature and the order of things was not okay. We were to leave that and grab onto this. And now you're coming back and saying, oh, but it is so true. Maybe for us, it's realizing in the very beginning, Adam and Eve were created to tend, to take care of the garden, to be stewards of the earth, not to evacuate, not to hit the eject button and be like, oh, sorry, you guys are screwed, have fun, but to take care of the earth. The earth sustains us. I had, that wasn't a plan, by the way. That was off the cuff. Random trail right there. So when we look at creation, what does it reflect to us? I think it reflects so many things, but here's a couple of things that I think are so important for us to kind of grasp, and that speaks to me. One of the first things that nature reflects to us is awe, wonder, beauty. Have we lost some of that? Have we argued and debated about having the correct doctrines or theology or whatever, who's in and who's out, and drawing these lines, perhaps is rediscovering the awe, the wonder, and the beauty in nature? How can you sit outside at a night with stars and just gaze up and be like, not filled with wonder and awe. Unless, unless you're one of my boys. <laughs> we went to Flagstaff uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, on their behalf, it was, it was a weird set of events, but we drove past a hunting store. So my kids say, I, and, it, and my uh, oldest saw the word gun, and they're like, do they sell guns here? <gasps> I mean, for him, like Flagstaff is like this weird, they're city boys now. They're, they're like, we're way out here, Flagstaff, they sell guns. And then we parked, because we were trying to find a way to get up, uh, I forget, but it was up, set away uh, from, from the city to kind of observe. And then this guy ran past us, and then this cop car was chasing him, and we saw him run across the road, and the cop car pull over and run and tackle them, and they're freaked out. So they're like, we're gonna get shot, whatever. So then we take them back up at night, and they're thinking, somebody's gonna come and shoot us. And I'm like, isn't this awesome? It's so great. And they're like, can we go now? Can we go now? So we have camping trip packed and uh, planned in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But they obviously need to get away a little bit more. Um, but it is interesting. We get away. We experience the wonder and the awe. 
And maybe it's a little scary at times for those of us that we're so used to the city, so used to being in control, going out to nature, discovering God's majesty and beauty. I think there's also an anxiety and a stress that comes, and I know some of your stories, and I, I, I listen and I hear this recurring all throughout lots of people where we used to grow up and things were so black and white and God fit in this nice, neat little box, and then something happened and poof, now we're in this ambiguity, oh my gosh, what do I think, what do I believe, I'm not sure, that doesn't work, but now what, and we're left in this stress, ambiguity, anxiety, how do we find rest in that? and look to nature to say, okay, God's been working for millions of years through all of this. God's working in this. I may not know how, but I'm here, and God is working. Can I trust that God will continue to lead me in the midst of this ambiguity, uncertainty, into something great and something beautiful? And the second thing that I think nature teaches us is that nothing remains the same. This is going back to the Buddhist understanding of impermanence. But nothing remains the same. You look at nature, things die, thing, or things are birthed, things grow, things evolve, things die. You look at the seasons, right? There's different seasons. Um, there's spring, summer, fall, winter, unless you live in Phoenix and then it's all goofed up. <laughs> because we can control it. And we have green grass in the middle of winter, which when I first moved here, I was like, this is weird, right? But seasons itself and nature itself, to use the quote from the Lion King, there's a circle of life, right? There's a circle. We cannot control everything. And I think what happens is oftentimes we bump up into things, relationships, situations, financial things, health things that are beyond our control. And that's what causes most of our anxiety, worries, and stress which again, the more we worry, it's not going to help our situation. But we've lacked that muscle of surrendering and trust because we control most of our environment. Perhaps nature has so much to teach us about the creator and about how to live. I want to invite you as we close to just close your eyes. And actually, um, yeah, while you close your eyes, I want to leave this with us, and, and then we'll, we'll head into a, a short prayer while the worship team comes back up here. But I want to invite you, if you are able to sometime within the next week or two, to spend time in creation, in nature. If you're here in Phoenix, that would have to be really early in the morning. But if you can't escape to Flagstaff uh, or the Rim or somewhere else, that's great. And at the very least, maybe it's just sitting somewhere that has windows that you can see off. Spend time and ask yourself, what does creation reflect about the creator, about the nature of life? What would creation like to speak to me? As we think about it, we've only had the Bible for about 2,000 years. What have people who lived before, how did they connect with God? Through observing creation, that somehow God speaks through creation. 